Welcome to Africa Live on CCTV News with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. Also ahead on the program. Higher taxes and royalties as Kenya reviews its mining code. And in winning form, South Africa and poor run of form in Sri Lanka tour as they win the T20 series. Hundreds of members and supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood protested at the Prosecutor General's office demanding investigations into stolen votes. It came as part of their rallying plan to demand Mohamed Morsi's reinstatement. Protesters objected to accusations by the Interior Ministry against their continued sit-ins. On Saturday, the Ministry spokesperson said it had proof of the sit-in organizers' involvement in killing, torturing, road blocking and other crimes. The interim government has also announced its intention to prevent further sit-ins, but stressed it would be non-violent. We are here because Al Sisi wasted our votes and spoke on behalf of all Egyptians without authority. After wasting our votes, we went to Rabah to take our rights. They killed our brothers in front of our eyes. Our strength came to us from what we saw. Their blood would not be wasted. We want justice. I came all the way from my city to tell the judicial authority that the Interior Ministry are wrongfully accusing us of crimes. They say we block roads. We elected an upper house and a lower house and a constitution and a president, which they stole from us. We want our votes and our voices back. All Egyptians must return and stand like men, and Morsi will return. We want the return of legitimacy, not for the sake of Morsi, but to establish a religious state. We are doing this for God. We left our jobs, children and houses for the sake of our religion. Meanwhile, in an attempt to break Egypt's political deadlock, U.S. Senators John McCain and Lindsey Graham arrived in Cairo on Monday to meet with the country's interim leaders. They are expected to hold talks with Interim President Adli Mansou, Defense Minister General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, and the Foreign Minister Nabil Fahmy. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State William Burns and the European Union Envoy Bernardino Leon also already held talks with Egypt's president on Sunday. And this as international diplomatic efforts have been stepped up a month after former leader Mohamed Morsi was ousted, plunging the nation into turmoil. Almost 300 people have been killed in political violence since Morsi's overthrow, with his supporters demanding he be reinstated after what they call a military coup. Meanwhile, Egypt's army chief met overnight with Islamist leaders to try to resolve the crisis, according to a statement. And al-Sisi stressed that there are, and I quote, opportunities for a peaceful solution to the crisis, provided all sides reject the violence. Well, let's now get the latest on the events in Egypt. I'm joined by CCTV's Adele Mahroui, live from the capital, Cairo, and Nina Maria Potts in Washington. Adele, let me start off with you. What is the latest where you are? Are the protests still ongoing? Yes, the protests are still ongoing. There has been more calls for more protests. Have you seen um, these uh, were part of the pictures were part of the protests that were held today in Cairo. Um, and they're trying to spread their protest to freeze the traffic of Cairo's um, main roads. This comes as part of the escalation program that the Muslim Brotherhood and their supporters are trying to pursue um, to continue their demands by uh, reinstating President Mohamed Morsi, return of the uh, Constitution and the Upper House of the Parliament. And Tuesday uh, should be their last million man march, as they call it, in Ramadan, where they expect to see tens of thousands, maybe hundreds, according to the Muslim Brotherhood, all taking the streets on the final days of Ramadan. Nina, in Washington, D.C., what does the United States though, hope to achieve with its mediation efforts? Do they still hold much sway with Egypt's different political parties? Well, I think Washington is in a real bind over what to do about Egypt. Uh, we're seeing a flurry of uh, diplomatic activity, as you mentioned. But Washington is really caught between a rock and a hard place, uh, with two conflicting messages coming out of Cairo. One is that 
Uh, the U.S. has abandoned Egypt. We've seen those comments from General al-Sisi, but also the accusation or the warning, rather, that America should no longer be involved in Egyptian politics and the Obama administration very sensitive to growing anti-American sentiment on both sides. As far as the American public is concerned, what they see very often is images of protesters shouting anti-American slogans, which is making it much harder for the Obama administration domestically to justify its policy and continued aid in Egypt. But again, some significant developments. We'll hear more from Senators McCain and Graham, who was sent by President Obama to hold these meetings with the interim leadership. The message there will be that the Egyptian military can no longer keep running the country, but also a controversial statement from U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry last week while he was in Pakistan, uh, who essentially said that the Egyptian military is restoring democracy. So conflicting messages from Washington to an increasingly complex situation. All right, Adele, conflicting messages there coming out of Washington, but how does the public, though, view the recent international mediation efforts? What's the likelihood they'll succeed in breaking Egypt's political deadlock? Well, um, Egyptians in general, um, the, from the official statement, they welcome uh, any international efforts to, uh, as you said, mediate or reach an inclusive transition. Uh, but on the other hand, if we're talking about in a popular way, um, Egyptians are not very comfortable seeing um, leaders and politicians of the international community coming here to mediate talks between Egyptians. They believe that these uh, efforts should be within the Egyptian public themselves, within the leaders of the political parties. They should not resort to any foreign body. Um, they fear that these influences might result or yield some similar um, situations like what they've seen in Libya and Syria particularly. These are the two examples that Egyptians feared they would follow the, the road of. So this, of course, Egypt has a different scenario because there is at least uh, one um, um, united uh, armed forces which might not lead to the same road. But overall, these efforts are not very welcome by uh, the people. They want to see uh, a straight, a different road taken path. Uh, on the other hand, um, the, the mediations have been going on. The United States is trying to restore its relations uh, with uh, Egypt or with the Egyptian sects, particularly that during uh, and exactly after July 3rd, when the army ousted President Mohamed Morsi, both and the army supporters were accusing the other of gaining or um, enjoying a U.S. Right. It's not the case uh, from the perspective of the other side. So the United States came trying to wrap this up, trying to say that this is democracy, but at the same time is still trying to reach for the Muslim Brotherhood. All right. Nina, still gauging the reaction there from the United States, though. Have there been any reactions from Washington following General Sisi's criticism of the U.S.'s failure to show support for Egypt's change of guard? And what repercussions could this have for U.S.-Egypt relations? Well, we're still waiting for the official uh, reaction to General al-Sisi's comments, and we'll certainly hear more from Senators McCain and Graham as their meetings with the interim leadership uh, develop. Before they headed off to Egypt on Sunday's uh, political talk shows, they had a very strong message for the Egyptian military. Uh, Senator Graham saying that Egypt's military needs to prove that it is uh, more aggressively working to hand over control to a civilian government and put power in the hands of the people. Uh, and a message too also for the Muslim Brotherhood to stay off the streets and get back into the political arena. Um, I think there is a general fear that Egypt could deteriorate uh, even further, that the political crisis uh, could get worse. And no one here wants to see a Syria-like situation develop, especially while so much American cash is pouring into the hands of the uh, Egyptian military. So there is very much uh, a strong view here that um, uh, Egypt needs to avoid that situation. And a sense here that there's also a bottom line beneath which both America and Egypt will not go, that it's a high stakes uh, situation, that fresh conditions need to be established, a fresh dialogue needs to be established between uh, Washington and Cairo, and that it's essentially in no one's interest for that relationship to go wrong.
All right, uh, Adele Makuru joining us from Cairo. Thank you very much for your insights. And Nina Potts in Washington, D.C., do stay with us for a minute as we will be returning to you in just a moment because uh, the United States has extended embassy closures by a week in the Middle East and Africa as a precaution after an al-Qaeda threat that U.S. lawmakers said was the most serious in years. The State Department said 19 U.S. embassies and consulates would be closed throughout Saturday out of an abundance of caution and that a number of them would have been closed anyway for most of the week due to the Eid celebration at the end of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. The United States initially closed 21 U.S. diplomatic posts for the day on Sunday. And some of those that reopened Monday include Kabul, Baghdad and Algiers. Last week, the State Department issued a worldwide travel alert warning Americans that al-Qaeda may be planning attacks in August, particularly in the Middle East and in North Africa. Well, Nina Maria Potts in Washington, we are returning to you now for um, that developing story there. Do we have any information on the exact nature of the threat leading to the closures, Nina? Well, uh, U.S. intelligence is examining the nature, the exact nature of the threat um, as we speak. There are three identified reasons uh, for the closures. One is that uh, there was an intercepted message uh, between al-Qaeda operatives. The other you mentioned there, uh, that th this threat may coincide uh, with the end of uh, Ramadan. And also there's been mounting concerns over prison breaks uh, in the region. So those are the three reasons that the State Department has identified as, as reasons to close uh, these diplomatic missions. You rightly pointed out that 21 were closed for Sunday. Now 19 of those have been extended to a week-long closure, and that move is really unprecedented. What is perhaps politically and domestically a key development here is that this move coincides with a big debate in the U.S., as you know, over national um, domestic surveillance programs. President Obama meeting with leaders of the intelligence community and lawmakers on uh, at the White House last week to defend uh, U.S. surveillance. So uh, the idea that this threat, this al-Qaeda threat is live and very real out there somewhat helps the Obama administration's um, uh, defense of these national surveillance programs and gives, gives those programs even more legitimacy uh, at a time when they are very much under attack. All right, uh, Nina Maria Potts joining us there live from Washington, D.C. Thank you very much uh, for your insights. Well, to stay with us here on Africa Live, as uh, still ahead on the program. Which way Zimbabwe? The challenges facing Mugabe and ZANU PF after poll victory. And angling for victory, candidates plea for votes ahead of Mali's presidential runoff. We follow the latest trends in global politics, economics, culture and sport and how Africa fits into the global picture. You decide what's important. We need some trade and justice. Africa's future will be determined by our... For women's equal opportunity for a better life. We have to change something and it's not the, the, the outsiders. Talk Africa, a new voice for the world. Watching Africa Live on CCTV News with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. At least 35 people have been killed in two separate gun battles between Nigerian security forces and Islamist sector Boko Haram in northeast Borno State. The army said on Monday, Boko Haram gunmen on Sunday attacked a, pl a police base in Bama, a town close to the Cameroon border that has been frequently hit by violence in recent months. One policeman and 17 members of Boko Haram have so far been killed there. Now, Boko Haram members also attacked a military base in the town of Malam Fature, triggering a gun battle that left two soldiers and 15 of its members dead. In mid-May, President Goodluck Jonathan declared a state of emergency and launched an offensive against the group in its stronghold in the northeast. Boko Haram, which wants to impose Sharia law in Nigeria's north and other spin-off Islamist groups, have become the biggest threat to stability in Africa's top oil exporter. 
Well, as the dust settles after Zimbabwe's elections, the ZANU-PF government is set to have its hands full in taking the country forward. Many people locally and internationally had been waiting on the polls to set the tone for the country's future, particularly on the economic front. Prime Wakutuya assesses the key challenges the incoming government needs to overcome. The economy was the biggest casualty of Zimbabwe's decade-long recession. However, under the inclusive government, business activity experienced a resurgence. Now, with ZANU-PF back at the helm, the state of the economy again takes center stage. Analysts say maintaining confidence will be the immediate task at hand for Mugabe as he embarks on his seventh term. To keep the economy as it is, although it is low, but just maintain it. Make sure that there is no panicking in the market where people feel that their money is in the banks is not safe. Uh, where people feel that uh, they are not uh, able to be able to do anything. Uh, imagine a situation where some people feel that prices will be increasing every day and so on. All those kind of things must be addressed. ZANU-PF is aiming to create more than 2 million jobs over the next five years, as well as drastically improving standards of living for millions. Unlike in the National Unity Government, it will bear sole responsibility for its success and failure. ZANU-PF will not be able to blame the MDCs. It might still want to talk about sanctions, but fundamentally it is their performance that will be measured uh, by the people of Zimbabwe. And because of the onerous nature of the task and the seriousness of their political competition around their ability to perform, they will have to pu pull up their socks. Beyond mending the economy, there is need to ensure the delivery of social services is restored. In addition, new lawmakers will implement a new constitution passed in March. With a two-thirds parliamentary majority, ZANU-PF will also be able to change aspects of the new charter that it is unhappy with. During the campaign, ZANU-PF pledged to change people's lives. Now that it's been given the people's mandate, it awaits to be seen whether Robert Mugabe and his party can deliver Zimbabweans to the promised land. Farai Mwakutuya, CCTV, Harare, Zimbabwe. Well, let's now cross over to the capital, Harare. CCTV's Jane Keo is joining us live from Harare. Jane, the MDC had indicated it would move to court to contest ZANU-PF's victory with claims that MDC supporters in Harare and Mashona land had been attacked. What's the latest? Well, Beatrice, they remain just that claims, and that's because there's still no verification, confirmation. Neither have we come across these victims, even though the MDC continues to make these allegations to the local media. Now it says supporters or people perceived to be backing the party are actually being harassed, victimized, and some are being displaced. And they say this is happening uh, in suburbs in Harare and out of Harare. Now, in terms of the court case, it has to happen this week. Some sources talking about Thursday. Of course, all this in line with the seven-day period given by the Constitution. Now, what will happen is that uh, once, the con once the MDC goes to court, the Constitutional Court will have 14 days to make a judgment. That's two weeks. And if it upholds the election of Robert Mugabe, he'll have to be sworn in within 48 hours. If it does not uphold his election, uh, election, new elections will actually be called within 60 days. Of course, MDC faces that huge challenge of proving that indeed this election was rigged. Well, Jane, President Mugabe and his government are clearly facing huge challenges as he starts his uh, new term. What impact is that position that is being taken by the MDC, that they will boycott government institutions, what impact is that expected to have uh, moving forward? Well, Beatrice, it actually depends on who you ask, that is ZANU-PF or the MDC. I actually spoke to an MDC official this afternoon, and he told me that this will have significant, albeit limited, impact uh, simply because decisions will obviously be coming from one side. But he says that the MDC took this position because by agreeing to work or cooperate with the government, they'll just be legitimizing and giving, cred uh, and giving credibility to this government that was not elected fairly and somewhat forced its way without the will of the people. Now, when you speak to ZANU-PF, PF. In fact, they've been on record saying that this will have little impact. And that's because Beatrice, as you know, ZANU-PF has two-thirds majority in parliament. And this allows them to actually make laws and even to amend the laws, including the constitution. Beatrice? All right. Uh, CCTV's Jane Keo joining us from the Zimbabwean capital, Harare. Thank you very much uh, for your insights. Now, Mali's election front runner, Ibrahim Babakar Keita, has urged all his supporters and opponents to keep calm as the West African country awaits a runoff that will take place on the 11th of August. 
Nor Makugu Sasa Small. Former Premier Ibrahim Bubaka Keita made an appeal in his first public comments since winning a vote marred by accusations of widespread fraud, where more than 400,000 ballots from the turnout of 3.5 million were declared spoiled. Keita garnered almost 20% votes more than the runners-up Sumaile Asise on the 28th of July, but failed to get an outright majority in a field of 27 candidates. The two now head into a second round on the 11th of August to determine who will lead Mali out of a political crisis. By giving me about 40% of the vote and a significant lead over the other candidates, the Malian people have clearly expressed their first choice. Early statements from the electoral officials had suggested that Keita's lead might be wide enough to avoid a second round of voting, but Sisi's campaign has denounced the reports. I'm calling today on the sons and daughters of Mali to come together. On August 11th, I'm asking you to increase your vote. I'm asking you to give me a clean and clear majority, an indisputable majority that will allow me to lead the national recovery that you're striving for. Mali experienced a military coup in March last year amid a months-long insurgency that saw militant Islamists take control of the sparsely populated north. France intervened in January this year reclaiming major towns with the help of a coalition of regional African forces. The first step of the newly elected president would be to promote unity in a country where recent turmoil interrupted decades of political stability. Noel Makugu, CCTV. And we still have more news, views and analysis for you here on Africa Live, including... Breaking new ground. CCTV collaborates with Kenya's KBC and Tanzania's TBC for unrivaled coverage of the great wildebeest migration. International news with the global perspective. World Insight is the only program with analysis from around the world. With lively discussions and feature reports. Tuning each week for World Insight only on CCTV News. With the rapid extinction of many species, Kenyan authorities have attached more and more attention to wildlife protection. Kenya's tourism minister, Phyllis Kandia, says her country has a grand plan to conserve wildlife in the Maasai Mara, and she has called on Tanzanian authorities to make a joint effort with Kenya to protect the area's wildlife. We have engaged the stakeholders, and the stakeholders means um, all the people that are involved in terms of um, the hotels around the, the Maasai Mara ecosystem. We are also involving the tour guides. We are involving the local community to ensure that they all participate and understand the problem or the benefits of actually conserving the wildlife within the Maasai Mara ecosystem. We are also involving the local government. 
we think this is the best way in ensuring that um, it, is, it is sustainable. We are also confronting the issue of coaching directly. As a government, we have come up with um, a bill that we ensure that anybody who is caught, um, you know, uh, killing the elephants, for example, or the rhinos, it is an economic crime. And so it's a very serious crime that um, we are ensuring that all Kenyans understand that this is, we all must conserve the wildlife, which has a population of 120 million people. The Maasai Mara Serengeti is one ecosystem. And so we must be sure that, we must ensure that we do the same things uh, and Tanzanians are also doing the same things because it's the same animals that cross the border to Tanzania. And staying with Africa's wildlife, CCTV has joined forces with Kenyan and Tanzanian broadcasters, KBC and TBC, to provide a special coverage of one of the wonders of the world, the Great Migration. The joint collaboration gives the viewers inside and outside China access to live footage of the spectacular crossing. And for those behind this operation, it's been a successful partnership. It's one of the wonders of the world. Every year between June and October, more than a million wildebeest make the treacherous crossing from the Serengeti in Tanzania to the greener pastures of Kenya's Masai Mara. And CCTV has joined forces with channels in both countries to show this incredible journey from beginning to end. An unprecedented collaboration of CCTV, KBC, KBC and TBC, state CCTV. broadcasters of China, Kenya and Tanzania. The special coverage began at the start of August, when Tanzania's TBC and Kenya's KBC partnered up with CCTV, offering viewers a week of live footage of the migration. In Tanzania, he's a reporter for the Tanzanian National Broadcaster. We'll also be joined by O'Brien Kimani, who is in Nairobi, and Gabriel Zakaria in Dar es Salaam. A collaboration that's been welcomed by the channel's audiences. We are grateful to CCTV for coming to Tanzania. It's doing a great job and giving a good impression of our country as well as helping us protect Tanzania's wildlife. We are grateful. Uh, I think it's, it's exciting to see millions of animals moving in one direction. Yeah, it's exciting. The joint collaboration also gives viewers in Kenya and Tanzania access to impressive footage they might otherwise not be able to see. For those behind the operation, it's a joint effort that's proved a success and could mark the beginning of other possible collaborations in the future. We would expect that uh, the wildebeest migration 2013 is just the beginning of CCTV and TBC cooperation. So we would expect further cooperation in other areas. Clementine Logan, CCTV. And to stay with CCTV for more on that for the next coming few weeks.